Hey guys, welcome back. Today we are continuing our conversations on motion and today we're talking about Newton's laws of motion. So we're going to go over Newton's first and second laws today. He has three of them, but we're going to do the third one a little bit later on. And um, one of these you are already going to be familiar with if <laughs> that is if you did your lesson yesterday. So let's go ahead and jump into it. So Sir Isaac Newton, he is the scientist that is credited with the laws of motions, and this is just a quote by him. It says, if I have ever made any valuable discoveries, it has been owing more to patient attention than to any other talent. So basically, Sir Isaac Newton, he was a physicist who really just paid attention to the world around him, and based on these um, observations, he was able to come up with the laws of motion as we know them today. So let's go ahead and talk about them. So Newton's first law states that an object at rest tends to stay at rest and an object in motion tends to stay in motion unless acted upon by an unbalanced force, okay? So think about like a soccer ball, for example. If it's not moving, if it's just resting on the grass, right? you're gonna need to come up and kick that ball in order to set it in motion, right? It needs an unbalanced force applied to it in order to get it to move. And then if you think about, you know, a car or something that's a moving object, it's going to need a force to apply to it in the opposite direction in order to get it to stop. And those forces can be things like friction, resistance, which we'll talk about a little bit more. So an object will keep doing what it's doing unless it's acted on by an unbalanced force. If the object was sitting still, it will remain stationary. If it's moving at a constant velocity, it will keep moving unless something acts on it to stop it. It takes force to change the motion of an object, okay? So what do we mean by an unbalanced force? Well, forces work on objects from all directions, right? So here, an example, we have a physics test textbook that's resting on a table. So gravity is working on the textbook, right? It's pushing down on the textbook. It's moving it in a downward direction. At the same time, you have the force of the table that's pushing up on the book as well. So you have forces in both directions. And because these forces are equal, the physics book is at rest, right? If you have forces that all in all equal zero, then your object is going to be stationary, okay? So if the forces on an object are equal and opposite, they are balanced and the object experiences no changes in motion. However, if they're not equal and opposite, then the forces are unbalanced and the motion of the object changes. So for example, with this textbook just sitting here, the force of the table and the force of gravity are balanced, so the textbook is at rest. However, if I were to come up and place my hand on the textbook and slide it to the left, there would be an unbalanced force that helps the textbook be in motion, okay? And after I stop applying that force, if I stopped pushing the textbook, then those forces would again be balanced and the textbook would come to a stop. So some real life examples, I already talked about the soccer ball, but if it sits at rest, it takes an unbalanced force of a kick to change the motion, right? Two teams are playing tug of war. They're both exerting equal force on the rope in opposite directions, and this balanced force results in no change of motion. So in order to win a tug of war, one of the teams would have to have an unbalanced force to pull the other team over. So Newton's first law is also called the law of inertia, and inertia is the tendency of an object to resist changes in its states of motion. So the first law states that all objects have inertia. The more mass an object has, the more inertia it has, and the harder it is to change its motion. So think about how difficult it would be for you to move, you know, a giant boulder versus moving a tiny pebble, right? The bigger and the more mass it has, the more inertia it has, and the more of an unbalanced force it would take to move it. And here's some more examples. So a powerful locomotive begins to pull a long line of boxcars that were sitting at rest. 
Since the boxcars are so massive, they have a great deal of inertia and it takes a large force to change their motion. Once they are moving, it takes a large force to stop them. So the train is a pretty large force, right? It can pull um, a lot of weight. So we would need that train in order to pull the boxcars. Like you yourself would not be able to get those boxcars to move, but the train would be able to. Um, another example, on your way to school, a bug flies into your windshield. Since the bug is so small, it has very little inertia and exerts a very small force on your car. So small that you don't even feel it. So, you know, if a train was coming at your windshield, you would definitely feel that because the inertia of the train would be much higher than your car. But because the little bug has a small inertia, you know, they're tiny, they weigh, you know, grams, if that, when they run into your car, the effect is not enough for you to feel. Okay. So exerting a larger force on an object causes a greater change in velocity. And a greater change in velocity means that there's a greater acceleration. So if the same force is exerted on a more massive and a less massive object, the more massive object can't accelerate as much. The more massive object will then have a lower velocity. So here we've got a stack of two books weighing two kilograms and a stack of three books weighing three kilograms. They both have a force of 12 newtons applied to them, but the two kilogram books have an acceleration of six meters per second because it's got a smaller overall um, mass and therefore its acceleration is higher. Which brings us to Newton's second law, which we did some practice with in yesterday's lesson. So Newton's second law says that force can be calculated by the following equation. F is equal to m times a, so mass times acceleration. So F is the force in newtons, m is the mass in kilograms, and a is the acceleration in meters per second squared. Remember in our first lesson where we talked about mass versus weight, we learned that the force of gravity on Earth is 9.8 meters per second squared, and in your assignment yesterday, you guys did some of those calculations. So you didn't know it at the time, but what you were doing was calculating Newton's second law. So let's take a look at some more examples. Um, I'll just do the first one, and you guys could do the second one on the, your own if you need some additional help, but again, you guys did do a bunch of these yesterday. So an object with a mass of 10 kilograms accelerates at a rate of 9.8 meters per second. What force is exerted on the object? Well, in this case, F equals M times A. Our mass is 10 kilograms. And then our acceleration is 9.8. So to figure out our force in newtons, we would just do 10 times 9.8, which of course would just give us an answer of 98 newtons. Because remember, force is in newtons. All right, so the last thing we're talking about today is something called friction. So friction is the force that opposes motion. So you can have different types of friction, but basically when you're talking about trying to move an object, so if you're moving furniture or like sliding a book across a desk, there's going to be um, a force that is trying to oppose that, right? Inertia, everything has inertia. It wants to resist motion, and friction is the force that opposes that motion. So sliding friction opposes the motion of two surfaces as they slide against each other, okay? So is exactly as it, it sounds. Sliding friction is the motion um, that opposes or opposes the motion as two surfaces slide against each other. Static friction prevents two surfaces from sliding against each other at all. So if you have static friction, then you 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 basically have to overcome static friction in order to make something move, but static friction prevents two surfaces from sliding against each other. And then rolling friction keeps a wheel from spinning in place and makes it turn instead. So without rolling friction, you know, if you think about the tires on a car, if we didn't have rolling friction instead of your car moving forward and rolling forward, being able to grip the ground and move, your car wheels would just spin in place and you'd never go anywhere, right? So rolling friction is related to car tires, okay? Another form of resistance is air resistance. This is a force that opposes the motion of an object that moves through the air. 
And this is dependent on an object's size, shape, and speed. So if we think about, you know, jumping out of an airplane, right? If you jump out without a parachute, the, you know, your uh, effective gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. If you don't have anything to, to slow you down, you're going to hit the ground pretty hard. However, if you jump out with a parachute, that air resistance will slow you down, right? It will resist your motion. It will slow your velocity, and then hopefully you can make it to the ground gently, okay? So those are Newton's first and second laws. Also, just a little intro to the different types of friction. Of course, we've done some practice with Newton's second law so far, but we're going to do a little bit more practice today. If you don't have any questions about this, you can move on to your assignment. But of course, as always, if you need help, let me know.